Only you know in your heart the certain adjustments that you need to make. And you know what they are. Nobody has to preach it to you. Good morning and welcome to this morning's uh, service. I thank God that you are still with us, joining us, following everything that the Lord wants you to absorb. I want to just quickly announce that uh, we will be doing our 21-day fast starting from the 1st of February. I would encourage those of you that are led by the Lord to go on this fast, that you would join us. You can choose any type of fast that suits you best. You can do a half a day fast. You can do 21 day fast with vegetables only. You can do a full day fast from 6 in the morning to 6 in the evening. The fasting type is left to you. The objective is to take control of your will, your desire, whatever your soul and spirit want to do. You must bring your flesh in obedience to that. So during the course of last year and perhaps even towards the end of the year where you might have gone astray slightly and certain difficulties may have overcome you, this is an opportunity to get yourself back into a right standing with God where you yourself feel comfortable that you are in the right place with God that is. And so you are free to do your fast, but we're doing it corporately as a church body starting on the 1st of February. So please join us. This morning, I'm going to take you on an excursion. I'm going to do an exegesis on one of the little known apostles called Philip. We're going to dig into him a little bit, but he came to write some of the most profound thoughts and it's captured in documents and some of them we're going to some of those thoughts we're going to go through nobody really knows who this man was and what influence he has had on the christian church and the ma the, the, the amount of miracles that he has done throughout the region of greece so much so that towards the end of his life, his life spanned about 50 years after Jesus was crucified. So he went on preaching, ministering and performed miracles over a period of 50 years since Jesus died. And in around uh, 80 years AD, uh, he was some say that he was hung upside down. Some other texts say that he was beheaded. But one thing is for sure is that he was killed for the sake of the ministry of God. And he was hung upside down with another apostle, Bartholomew. And while he was on that upside down cross, he told the rulers of the Greek city, Hierapolis, not to kill Bartholomew, but instead to kill him. His heroics is not seen. And we will read parts of what he has said, that the revelations that he has written down for us to absorb is not going to be available except to a few in the end of days. We'll go through that at just a little bit of, uh, of information about him, a, a relic which is housed in a crypt in, of uh, Basilica, Santi Apostoli in Rome. This crypt holds ancient artifacts. One of them is a painting uh, of what we call Saint Philip the Apostle Philip. And these scripts, which are in Rome mainly, 
but held all over the world, in, including New York. They hold artifacts that verify that these apostles and many like them actually lived and carried out the miracles that we read about. Now this document that of, of, of Apostle Philip was, was lost for centuries until the major find that we all probably know about at Nag Hammadi in Egypt on the banks of the river Nile. Major documents were discovered and the letter or the gospel of Philip was one of them. Now he didn't write the gospel in the sense that how Matthew recorded it or John recorded it but he did it in a prose sort of fashion in, in a fashion like the Song of Solomon's you know the Proverbs and, and we're going to go through some of the nuggets that he left behind because all of his revelations came because he walked closely with the Lord Jesus Christ and so his understanding of God's knowledge is vast We'll pick up some of the stories from the Bible about him so that we get a small introduction of who Philip is. Because, you know, when you read the Bible, you probably ignore this man because he's not much spoken about. Yet, the documents that are available to us, some of which we're not going to go through today, but tells us that he, he's, he performed greater miracles than the Apostle Paul. We're going to read some of the stuff that he has uh, left for us in the Bible itself. The first thing we have to, before we actually you know, dig into, into the Apostle Philip, he, he introduced Christ to most of North Africa, especially um, the region of Egypt and more especially Ethiopia. Now we're going to pick up in the book of Acts, which gives us an introduction to post Jesus era. Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. So he arose and went. And behold a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority, under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians who had charge of all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning. And sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit of the Lord said to Philip, Go near and overtake this chariot. Let's analyze that text for a moment so that, you know, when I introduce you to the history of, of our Christian faith, you have a full grasp of, of who you are and where we've all, uh, especially the Africans, evolved from. This queen of Ethiopia, she was from the same line as uh, the queen of Sheba. You remember queen of Sheba and I spoke to you about how the queen from Ethiopia went to uh, Solomon and she was amazed at his wealth and she received the gospel at that time from Solomon and brought it over to Ethiopia and from then on all her line including Haile Gabriel Selassie I told you he was assassinated and then that kingdom of Christianity fell apart and I think it's because they were planning to bring the whole world into this new world order so Haile was assassinated and and that whole kingdom line fell apart it is actually called the kingdom of Kush and, and so Candace is actually a Moroitic term. Moroitic was a tribe that died off about 400 years or the language that died off about 400 years after Christ. But this term is Kandake. It's referring to uh, a monarchy, queen, uh, you know, the, the, the ruler of the land of Ethiopia. So Candace was not actually her name. She had another name from that line. We won't get into that now. But but she had major influence, obviously, over the belief system. Now, remember, she carried on from Solomon, uh, Queen of Sheba, she carried down into Ethiopia the belief system of the Jews. And so, 
this eunuch was also of Jewish influence because she, this man was, this eunuch was the treasurer of the queen which they refer to as Candace or Kandake. And so this man's influence over her treasury was great and, and they were of Jewish influence now. But now the Lord needed to bring these Jewish influenced Ethiopians to absorb and receive Christ as their savior. So the eunuch was curious. We don't have the scriptures here, but from what I'm telling you now, because I've been through the scriptures that, that not in the Bible, this eunuch was curious about what events were taking place at the time Jesus was crucified. And so he made his travels into that region and he was in the desert and he was reading the book of Isaiah and God saw this man and God knew that they needed now to reject the Jewish traditions and accept Christ as their savior. So he instructed a man that we now introduced to Philip to actually go and he said you're going to go to this desert and you're going to see this man come close to him and speak to him and make sure you introduce Christ to him. And so this eunuch was busy reading the book of Isaiah in a chariot and Philip arrived there and he actually ended up, if you continue reading the book of Acts, he baptized after ministering to him, he baptized this eunuch and the eunuch took Christianity back into Ethiopia. The, the influence of Philip was massive and then God miraculously made Philip disappear from there. I don't know to what extent we can believe that but some uh, references is that he immediately was taken away by the spirit into a different region. But Philip's main concentration of influence was in a Roman controlled Greek country where they eventually, as I mentioned, they killed him. When he was walking with Jesus, we'll see a few of the times where he's mentioned, mostly by John. John chapter 6, Then Jesus lifted up his eyes, and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? But this he said to test him. For he himself knew what he would do. This is one of the few times we hear where God was actually teasing Philip. And said, Philip, you can see all these 5,000 people gathered here, or men, and plus the children, women. Where are we going to get food to feed? Where are we going to buy bread to feed these people? And he wanted to see what, what response uh, 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 Philip had for him. And then you remember the story about we just have a few loaves of bread and fish. Then in John chapter 12, where his influence with the Greeks was so strong that when the Greeks came to worship at the temple, they wanted to meet Jesus. And they knew that Philip was close to the Lord. So in John 12 we read, Now there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. Then they came to Philip who was from Bethsaida of Galilee and asked him saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. And then Philip went to Andrew and uh, they both went and approached Jesus. Jesus, from what we learn, he changed the topic. I don't know whether he eventually met with these people. And then one of the mo most profound things that Philip learned, which he wrote about in his gospel, uh, is from John chapter 14 and we're going to read that. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and yet you have not known me? Philip, he who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe? that I am in the Father and the Father in me. And then Jesus goes on in other places to, to say that he is in us and we are in him. And you'll see the, the profoundness 
of what Philip took away from Jesus' teaching as we go through what Philip wrote. So as is Proverbs, we're going to go through sections of Philip's writing and I pray by the end of what I'm sharing that in order to nourish, to shape your spirituality, to bring you closer to God, that the volume of stuff that I'm going to share with you, the weight of stuff, that it helps to adjust your spirit, to strengthen you, to bring you closer to God in preparedness for his coming. From the Gospel of Philip, verse 2, a slave can hope only to become free. A slave cannot expect to inherit the estate of the master. Yet a son is not only a son, but also a co-owner of his father's estate. Now, when you understand Philip's mindset, he is calling everybody who is not freed by the blood and the salvation of Jesus. He is calling them slaves because they truly are slaves to this world. They bow to what they need in the world. They are therefore in bondage by the world. So I think I don't need to go into details about how people are so dependent on things, on things of this world, that they unwittingly bow themselves to these things and therefore they become slaves. And God says, if a person has to bring themselves to bow to the needs that the world has offered to them, then they have no right to be called sons of God, which gives them no right to inherit kingdom things. And his inheritance will not be as a slave is. So God is profoundly telling us that as long as we as long as the, we, de, we our, our happiness, our joy, our, our fulfillment comes by what the world can give us, by our clothes, by our cars, by our houses, by entertainment. If, if these things are the things that make us happy or sad, they control us. Access to it controls us. If we are that character, and we don't break out of it. He considers us slaves and therefore have no right to inherit. I hope some part of this is registering. In verse 3 it says, There are those who inherit the perishable. They belong to the perishable. And thus they inherit the perishable. Those who inherit the imperishable are imperishable. They become owners of both the imperishable and the perishable. People of the perishable inherit really nothing. Because what can a perishable man inherit? So a man that does not spiritually, in other words, when Jesus comes, he says, our body will die, but our spirit is imperishable. And therefore, we inherit imperishable things. Our treasure is not here. Therefore, we cannot be slaves to the things here. But the people who inherit things here in the seen world, in things that perish, these people won't have access to the imperishable. But those that have access to God benefit here and there. Let's move on in verse 7. Those who sow in winter reap in summer. Oh man, this is so profound. I hope you listening to this with your spirit and your soul and not your mind because if you are, you're going to miss some very powerful revelations. He goes on to say, the winter is the earthly. 
understand he's talking about winter being earthly so if we read the first sentence again this is what it says those who sow in the earthly reap in the summer now the summer is the heavens those who sow in the earthly reap in the heavenlies wow but the summer is another aeon, aeon which means another heaven another place a higher place let us sow on the earth in winter so that we reap the harvest in summer so let us sow here on earth so that we can reap the benefits there that's why jesus it goes in line with what jesus was saying store up your treasures there where it matters so how do we sow on the earth there are various means of sowing this doesn't only apply to money sowing this applies to all aspects of your spirituality so invest your time in growing your spirit that's sowing invest your time in listening to words that change who you are i don't want to go into too much detail but i think if you need to hear this if it is you then you fully understand the effort you put in to bowing to the worldly needs compared to the effort you put in to growing your own spirit listen to the next line therefore we should not pray to god for the winter <laughs> let's change that word because philip tells us winter means earthly let we should not pray to god for the earthly because the earthly is followed by the heavenly because the winter is followed by the summer we should not pray to god for the earthly this is what he's advising philip is saying try not to pray for the earthly because if you inherit the heavenly like we read just now then you will also inherit the earthly so it doesn't matter what the earthly has for you but if you are imperishable and you inherit imperishable things then god says you'll also inherit perishable things so you don't have to actually pray for anything and i know sometimes because of the circumstances we go through we tend to pray for the earthly because of the trauma the aches and the pains and the heaviness and the trials and we ask god to take care of that but see what philip is saying he already knows about it you shouldn't be even mentioning it that's why one of the previous sermons i told you thankfulness why do you thank him because he already confirmed if you are of imperishable you will inherit imperishable and perishable we read that so in other words he's saying it's vanity it's actually worthless to pray in the winter in the earthly but the one who tries to reap in winter will not really reap but only pluck out the sprouts so the one who tries to reap in the earth will not really reap anything but only pluck out the sprouts the one who does not follow this will not reap the harvest moreover such one will not only be without the harvest but will have no strength in the sabbath sabbath means rest or the heavenly they'll have no strength there so if you don't follow what he's saying philip is saying he says if you make it there you won't have strength you won't have power you won't have grace you you know that some people are going to make it to heaven by the skin of their teeth and everybody is going to get rewarded according to what they have done we we know this it's in the bible and some people will be getting hardly anything they'll be strengthless they'll have no um uh, some people will be greater than them in terms of strength uh, influence or whatever the lord has planned for us but i can tell you it's of very it's very valuable Let's read what it continues. 10. Those who have detached themselves from the earthly become whole eternal. Now he goes on. 
for many lines speaking about this winter, this earth. You know when we come to arguments in our home, when it comes to the fights that we have, the scuffles we have at work, the, the, the jealousy that we face, what is it all about? It's all about the earthly. It's all about the winter. There's no argument at home that happens about spiritual things. Most arguments happen about physical, earthly, material, perishable things. And I want you to take stock of these arguments and where your mind goes to. When it comes to how angry you get about material things, about earthly, winter things. And most, when you, when you come to this realization of what you argue about, you will stop dead in your tracks because you realize this thing that I'm angry about is winter. It has no place for me. And you will immediately adjust your character. And this is what I'm trying to get across. And I'm trying to adjust character so that in your home, there will be peace. There will be harmony. Because we need the people we love around us to face what we are about to face. It's going to be ugly. If God leaves us to tarry, we may have some challenging times ahead. I know I mentioned to you, I'm going to speak to you about AI, but I felt very strongly to go and teach you about what Philip had to say before I give you any extracurricular stuff. Verse 11, the importance attached to the earthly things is a great delusion. For they divert our thoughts from the one, which is God, who is eternal, to that which is transient, to that which is transient means obviously it comes and goes. Born it dies. And in this case, the one who hears about God does not perceive behind this word the eternal. But thinks about the transient. In the same way behind the words the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the life, the light, the resurrection and the church. People do not perceive the eternal. But think about the transient unless... They have already cognized or recognized the eternal through, the, through personal experience. These words are only misleading to earthly people. If they were in the divine aeons or heavens, they would not use these words among earthly concerns and things. Because these notions are related to the divine aeons. Hey, let me explain this. This is so profound, one of the most profound things. Let me stay, start by saying this, which was recorded in the summary of these texts. And God the Father, who is the universal ocean of the primordial, the consciousness, the first original consciousness. When, when you say God, People picture an old man with a long beard sitting on a throne that you can envision on the earth. A throne, probably the greatest imaginary throne you can have. But you see a man sitting there. When, when you say God or the Father, when you say Son, the Son, God the Son, you picture this man with the long hair and with the beard and probably a halo over his head. When you picture the Holy Spirit, and some churches do that, they'll say there's a cloud of glory. They picture the Spirit like, you know, like an invisible cloud moving around. And, and so when you, uh, uh, Philip is telling us, you, you, you cannot put God's things in perspective of human mind because when the earthly people conceive God, they conceive it through the eyes of the earthly or the mind of the earthly people. Verse 11 we'll read again. The importance attached to the earthly things is a great delusion. Let's read the next line. And in this case the one who hears about God does not perceive behind the word the eternal but thinks about the transient. He thinks about earthly. Transient is earthly things. Things that 
come born die they think so they they cannot see god in the way who he actually is he is the primordial he is consciousness he is everywhere he is not a thing that man can imagine neither is the holy spirit neither is the son now if you don't have spiritual understanding philip says you 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 you'll be misled verse 13 the earthly rulers wanted to deceive people we learned about this quite a bit eh? since they understood that people have the same origin with the really worthy they took good names and gave these names to bad th- things <clears throat> in order to deceive people and bind them to the bad in this way and now these earthly rulers suggest to people that they keep away from the bad and cling to the good these earthly rulers strive to make formerly free men slaves forever wow this is the most prophetic statement it is exactly what we go through now the earthly rulers tell us that the mainstream media is good the rest is not because they want you to cling to their good but god is saying through philip this good is actually bad so in order for you to cling to the bad they call it good it's the same with the thing they wanted to put you in their arm they took good thing god's thing things that god gave them the intelligent through the through their father the satan the devil stole from our father the intelligence the wisdom to put all these things together and create all these things it was stolen from heaven these are things that the inventions was no, is not satan's he's nev- never original every the wisdom of frequency the wisdom of light the wisdom of everything comes from the father he took all these things the devil he made them bad and he tells the rulers to tell us they are good like this uh wifi thing the 5g and 6g and all these things that are going on robotics ai everything that they want to do they're telling us it's good because they want us to cling to the good in their eyes but it's actually bad now philip prophetically tells us this so many thousands or hundreds of years ago he's not finished with the earthly rulers he goes on 16 the earthly rulers thought that what they did they did by their own power and will but in reality the holy spirit in secret accomplished all that through them accomplished as he considered appropriate also they saw everywhere the true knowledge which existed since the beginning here we go that's what i've been telling you and many people see it while it is being sown but only a few of them recall about it by the time of the harvest wow when is the harvest it's happening right now and what does philip say only a few of them recall about it by the time of the harvest so he's saying that you see this this scripture was hidden for so long it was only found in 1945 in the banks of that nile river in nagamadi dig and 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 philip is saying you know it's it's timed by god that it's found now but you see even though it's found it's not made its way to the knowledge of everybody there's a very few select people philip says but only a few of, the, of them will recall it in other words will 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 remember what i'm saying will acknowledge what i'm saying and those few people happen to be you and me i feel privileged thank you lord that among the world of people that you showed this to me so he's saying while this is happening while this devil is trying to sow these things only few people will pick it up so so philip is actually prophesying about us that we are the few that will pick it up during harvest time and so I, you know i want you to thank god that he has opened your eyes most of you or all of you if you hadn't received these kinds of knowledge from wherever you got it about what the world rulers are up to you would probably be dead by now and your soul would have been lost 
So the gratefulness that I have to God is immeasurable for opening my eyes. And then something so nice that he says that makes my heart jump for joy. These rulers, these earthly rulers, they did this by their own power. But that's what they thought. But the scripture is telling us the Holy Spirit in secret used them to do these things to prepare, prepare the harvest. So they're not running loose, doing their own thing, and the devil is not under control. God's hands is always in control. And he guides me. And that's the guidance I try to give you. Some people take it, some people are rebellious, some people want to do their own thing, they feel they know better. So I just have to leave them. I can't force people. But if you are hearken to the words that I'm giving you, it comes from the throne room of God. It comes from the pit of my belly where the Lord speaks. So sometimes we try to fight it. But God is going to direct only his children. Now I know some people ask, you know, how are we going to go naked? You know, when the Lord comes, all our clothes will fall down and we'll, we'll you know, the resurrection, we're going to go up without clothes. You know, this question. So he addresses that, poor Philip. 23 says, there are people who are afraid of rising naked. This is because they want to rise in the flesh. Yet they do not understand that those who wear the flesh are naked in front of the spirits of God. So God is saying, if you have flesh on, even when you have clothes, in the eyes of, you are naked in the eyes of God. So I don't know what you worried about. Neither flesh nor blood can enter the abode of God. So you cannot enter with this body. Flesh and blood cannot enter there. Verse 15, and what is that which will enter? It is that which belongs to Jesus and to his blood. Therefore he said, they who will not eat my flesh and drink my blood will not have the true life in them. What is his flesh? He says, logos. Oh. He says wisdom is his flesh. If you don't eat wisdom, and his blood is the Holy Spirit, if you don't eat his blood, eat wisdom and drink the Holy Spirit, you won't go into heaven. Verse 26, Jesus conquered the hearts of people without revealing his essence. To everyone, he revealed himself as much as they could comprehend. He did the so. To the great, he appeared as great. To the small, he appeared as small. To the angels as an angel and to people as a man. At the same time, his divinity was hidden from all. Some seeing him thought that they saw a person equal to him. Jesus, Paul, uh, Philip is talking about the rela uh, relatability of, of Jesus. He was relatable. He, was, he brought himself down to deliver. You know, this is why I have problems sometimes with ministers of the gospel. When they see a man who is well educated, drives a good car, has a good suit, maybe pays good tithes. They give that person special attention. But when it comes to the poor people, the people who just dress with one clothes and come to church, they, they sort of just brush them off. When it comes to pray over them, they'll give it to the junior people, pray over these people. But for the rich man's house, I'll personally go there and I'll pray. So he, people cannot be identified with and. You know, the, the, so if you are listening to me, I want you to humble, bring yourself down to be at, to address anybody at the level that they are. This is God's gift. He says, you, you have to be just like me. Listen to verse 34. Saints are served by evil powers as well. These powers are blind because of the Holy Spirit. They think that they serve their men. But in fact, they work for the saints. <laughs> oh my God. You see these Illuminati people, the ones that sold their souls. You know when you look for, when you look at scriptures or you look at uh, anything spiritual on, on any site on the internet, the Illuminati people put their ads in between to say join the Illuminati today so that you have wealth and money and fame. They actually got that application on on the internet. These powers, God is calling them, the, 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 the devil's powers, I mean. They use these people. They, they are the devil's people. And the devil's people don't realize 
that they're not working for their master. They're working for the saints of God. In what way is a secret that the Holy Spirit knows? So when you see these things, don't get agitated and angry. I just get hurt that if there's souls among them, those souls are misled. But we have to let God be God and we got to do our part to make sure that our best is done. And this is why, come any circumstance, Nash and I and, and, and our family, Nicole, and it, no matter what sickness or what we go through, we want to make sure that by all means, you get what you, we have to do God's very best. We don't know where this goes and who it impacts. But we know that we have to do our best. Verse 40. There are animals devoted to men like cows, donkeys and others. And there are those not devoted to men, which live apart in the desert. Man plows in the field with the help of devoted animals. Thanks to this, man provides with food both oneself and the devoted animals, but not those undevoted. In the same way, the perfect man works with the help of those who are faithful and prepares everything that is necessary for their being. Thanks to this, everything is at the right place. The good and the bad, the right and the left. But the Holy Spirit takes care of everyone and controls everything. The faithful, the hostile and the indifferent. He unites them and separates them in order that they all may gain power when he decides it is necessary. What a statement. You know, sometimes you wonder why people like Bill got so much of power. Why this world health has so much of influence. Why the governments are so corrupt. Philip is saying, God gives these hostile people, these enemies of God, power at the right time for the right purpose. God is saying that. And he says when he comes to his people, he gives them power at the right time. God, is, Philip is telling us the Holy Spirit is in control all the time. Hey. And then he talks about this animal. He, you know, I think it's plain, but just to put it in lay terms if you didn't understand it. You see, we take care of the cow. Uh, I mean, we, 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 we use the cow to plow the field, to have milk. We use... The sheep for food, for wool. And, and what man does in turn is when the sheep and the cattle provide for man. Man in turn feeds them and keeps them so that they both survive. The dependent animals and man. And because these animals are devoted, man looks after them. But man does not look after the lion and the tiger in the jungle. They have to look after themselves. So God is saying in, in the same way when you devoted to God, when, when you look after his kingdom, in whatever way, then God is obligated to look after you as well. And no matter what happens, he will make provision. You know, sometimes it feels when you go through things that God has just abandoned me, he hasn't provided let me tell you, maybe there's some adjustment you need to make in your spirit. Maybe you've cursed God. Maybe you haven't thanked him enough. Maybe when things were good, you took it for granted. Maybe you don't contribute to his kingdom. I don't know what the reason is, but when you go through something, this scripture says God, the Holy Spirit takes care of everyone. And he controls everything. And sometimes people need to go through things to be taught something. So that you don't make that mistake again. But whatever God does, he does it to strengthen the human spirit. 44. It is not possible to perceive anything of the imperishable unless one becomes like it. Wow. You, you, when I explain what this means, it's so powerful. In the world of the true life, everything happens not in the same way as among earthly people. They perceive the sun, although they are not the sun. They perceive the sky and the earth and all the other objects not being them. But in that world, you perceive something and you become it. Thus you perceive the Holy Spirit and you become him. 
You perceive Christ and you become Christ. You perceive the Father, you become the Father. In that world you perceive everything, but you do not perceive yourself. Because you perceive yourself as that one. Because you become the one whom you see. This is why John 14, 20 tells us, at that day you will know that I am in the Father and you in me and I am you. So, you'll be merged into what some of these Hindus call that one consciousness. They, understanding is a bit uh, skewed when it comes to how you achieve this. But God is saying, I am omnipresent. I am in everything. And I am not this one old man sitting. So Philip is saying, when you are in that world, you have no identity as you. You are becoming one with Christ. Christ is one with you. And he says, when you achieve that, when you go there, then you'll understand what it means. It's not like how we see the sun there, or oh, that's the sun. That's my wife. That's my husband. That's my child. There's no such thing in that place. These things he's telling us, our mind, the human mind cannot really perceive it. 48. And a pearl, even if it's cast down into the mud, it's not despised. And if one covers it with balsam, it does not become more valuable. But it is always valuable to its owner. It is the same with the sons of God wherever they may be. They are still of value to their father. So, it doesn't matter what, who you are, but you are valuable. I think we, we, we should know this and absorb it. Verse 54, the Lord once came to the dye works of Levi. He took 72 different dyes and threw them into the vat. Then he took all fabrics from it and they were white. He said, even so, the son of man works. Now Levi, Luke 5, 29, introduce us, introduces us to him. He was a very rich businessman. He, used to, he had a dye factory. Then Levi gave him, in Luke, a great feast in his own house. And there were a great number of tax collectors and others who sat down with him. Now, this is Levi, and a friend of the tax collectors. He was a businessman. He invited Jesus to come to his house. And when Jesus went there, Philip tells us that he took Levi and went into his workshop. And he took 72 different dyes. He put it in the dye container. He dumped clothes inside. And instead of culling, coming out in all different colors, they all came out white. This was, the, this was a miracle we, we never saw or we never heard about. But it was in, to introduce Levi to the idea of getting washed in the blood. No matter what color you are, no matter who you are, what you've done. Everything comes out white. 56. When a blind person and a sighted person are both in darkness, they are not different from each other. But when light comes, then the one who sees will see the light. And the one who is blind will remain in darkness. This is another beautiful analogy of when people are blinded spiritually, even when people are shining the light of the truth. Like how you, you try to share with people stuff you hear from me and other things that your spirit is blessed with. And you try to give people that. It's like they, they shut you off because they're blind. Even with the light shining on them, they're blind. But once we were also dark, but once the light came, we began to see. But those who were blind will never see again. And you can't frustrate yourself over that. You've got to know that it's a prophetic word. The Lord said, Blessed are those who verily existed before were born on the earth. The one who verily exists now was like this and will be. God is saying, every soul that's here existed there. That's how God said to Jeremiah, I knew you before you were in your mother's womb. You were there. You were sent here in this temporary vessel. And when you go, you'll go back just like how you came, pure. This is what he's saying. And then he said, blessed are those who verily existed before they were born on earth. Which means that there are people here, and I spoke to you about this. They are called gulems. People with no conscience. 
people with no soul. They never exist before. They just showed up here by the will of man. Check this out, 59. If those who were immersed in the flow, that means in, in flow of God, in, in the oneness of God, and having received nothing in it, say, nevertheless, I am a Christian. Then they take this name on credit. But if one has really received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, then such a person has the name Christian as a gift. The one who received a gift does not have to give it back. But the one who received a credit, this credit may be taking, taken back. Let me see if I can give you the crux of what Philip is trying to explain. He's saying, you know when people go in the waters of baptism, when they come out, they don't get the Holy Spirit, they don't, get, they don't adjust their lives. They want to stay exactly who they are. And, and it goes on in other parts to say that they, sometimes they come because they want evil spirits to be coming out of their lives. But they never really got baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now baptism in the Holy Spirit doesn't mean bara 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 bara. It doesn't mean you must speak in tongue. That's not baptism in the Holy Spirit. Don't get confused by these fake teachers. These people who want to possess people, don't listen to them. Baptism in the Holy Spirit is when you truly want God. You truly make an effort. You got something. You make an effort to adjust certain things that you know in your spirit is not right to do. You need to adjust that character. Sometimes it takes a bit of time. But at least they're making an effort. But there's others who continue just anyhow as they are. And then they... They say they are Christian. They borrowed that name on credit and God will take it back. But those, the others who truly got the baptism of the Holy Spirit, God says they got a gift. That name Christian is a gift. And God says he can't take a gift back. So all he's asking is, you know, that's why this fast is so important. Adjust your life. At least... If you really truly got the baptism of the Holy Spirit, there's an adjustment you need to make. And during this time is the best time to try and adjust it. That will qualify you to carry the name Christian as a gift and not on credit. Those who have come out of the earth cannot be seized by evil spirits as it can happen when one is in the earthly. Now they are above passion and fear. They become masters of their own nature. They are above earthly desires. Wow. I'm just going to read a few portions. Verse 38. <clears throat> Sometimes it happens that evil spirits see a single man and seize him, torture him. And how can he escape them, being subjugated by his own desires and fear? Where can he hide from them? See those desires that you have. The fear that you have. Fear is the grandfather of many, many emotions negative ones. If you have these two emotions, maybe you don't even realize it. You have the fear of death, you have the fear of failure, the fear of losing your job, the passion for wanting something, the desires, all these earthly things, the ones that you attach to in winter. It's earthly winter. It, it subjugates you and the evil spirits and there's no escape. But when you leave the earth, when you transform and go up into the heavens, the devil has no control because you're, you don't have this flesh here. There's no desire for any earthly things. This is what he is teaching us. There's a verse I was talking about. It happens often that some people come and say, we want to become believers in order to get rid of evil spirits and demons. But if the Holy Spirit had been with them, then no evil spirit would have cleaved to them. So there he's talking about whether... Christian is a gift to you or you borrowed it or it's on credit where God can take it back. That's because you're still attached to the passions and the desires of this winter, this season, this year, earth. And so if you want to become a believer and a Christian, there's adjustments you need to start making. God will protect you. I believe it sincerely. That if at least you start making the effort. And if you do. Remember, I, if you place your spirit under my care. Your soul in my hands as your shepherd. 
You don't realize this. But every night before I go to bed, whether I know your name or not, God records everything. He knows who your shepherd is. And I pray, Lord, to protect my family, my home, and all the people I call family. The people that have entrusted me with their spiritual life. And I cover them. And make sure that even if the devil attacks you, the Lord knows about it and he allows it. So that it can strengthen you and grow you. But nothing happens to you that you don't go off the path. But only you can control that. And I pray that God... As Philip has been teaching us, I'm going to end here. There's so much more Philip has told us, but probably if the Lord needs me, I'll extend it next week to did some more, give you some more details. It's beautiful. Philip had a beautiful experience with God. And, and he left with us nuggets. But I want to just implore you before I close. And I'm going to pray with you. But you know only sitting there, even if you're sitting with three or four people around you, only you know in your heart the certain adjustments that you need to make. And you know what they are. Nobody has to preach it to you. In your heart, silently make a decision. From this moment on. Look, these documents that they found verify that this man existed and all these things happened. Together with the artifacts that are present, it's testimony that the stones are speaking out to glorify God. These things are not fairy tale, beloved. They're not a story that cannot be proven. These people existed. In fact, one of the archaeologists in the city of Hierapolis in Greece, they dug up the place where this man was buried. So we have evidence that this Philip existed. And what he put down on paper is not his own thoughts. It's directed from the Lord. And I pray that as his words echo in your spirit through my voice, that you will start to refine yourself and say, Lord, if I haven't been right in 2022, at least before you come, I need to not take the name Christian on credit. I need it as a gift. Can I pray with you? Raise your hands where you are, please. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I ask you to cover the children. Every one of them. You know I have a relationship with you about them. But Lord, right now as I'm preaching, there's something happening in their spirits. There's some changes that are taking place. I ask you, Lord, to light that fire in them. As they prepare to take the name Christian as your gift to them to have the Holy Spirit truly abide in them where the evils cannot attack cannot enter their bodies bless them Lord whatever challenges that they are going through that you will give them whatever strength and resilience they need bring about circumstances to give them breathing space Father Many of your people that go through this, they don't long for worldly things. I know them, Lord. They just want so that they can have some peace, some semblance of happiness that they have. Their bodies are not suffering. Their families are not suffering. Provide for them, Father. And I'm sure, Lord, that whatever lesson they have needed to learn, that you've taught it to them. Bless them now. Cover them in your blood. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. God bless you. Have yourself a beautiful week. Please remember, stay close to God. See you next week.